aren't able to be here and who might later want to have the information can have it. Also, so I can look at it later and decide how I can do this better in the future. <laughs> okay, so as soon as Bagan gives me permission, I'll start recording. And there we go. Okay, so I've started recording and now I'll get into the content. And as I get into the content, I want to, Begum, some of you know who she is. Uh, it is really thanks to her that we are all here. And we, Begum and I, had planned a series of presentation trainings in Turkey in April 2020. And <laughs> the universe had another plan. <laughs> and COVID-19 physically grounded us, literally. And in the meantime, uh, Begum created this platform in her Baikush Okulu, in her OWL school. And in the OWL School, this is Begum's online platform designed for and by a team of friends, guides, supporting each other, doing community-based work, to deliver workshops, presentations, to be able to see in the dark times of the world, lightness. And all of us help, and all of which helps us to remember that we are not alone. Um, I really like this statement by the OWL School, especially in this moment, even though it wasn't necessarily created for this moment. I think it has a splendid uh, connection to where we all are right now. So with that connection, that's what I want to talk about. Now I've created for you, I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. I have created a very, very small presentation. And let's see, let's go right here. So this is what our topic is. Our topic is Food Speaks, it's a live dialogue between you, your body, and your food. So a little bit about me as I move through the agenda, okay? So the agenda, we have three topics basically today. Food Speaks, what does that mean? Can everyone see this? Let me go back to Zoom here. Opa. Hello? Hello. Can everyone see? Just give me a thumbs up if you can see this. Can you see my screen? Uh oh. Hello, anybody there? If you can see my screen, will you say so? Yes. You can unmute your screen. Yeah, yes, I we see. Can, we can. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much because I've been on calls where other people were presenting and we couldn't see the screen. So I just want to double check. Thank you so much. Okay. So we have three main topics. We have food speaks. What does that mean? And that will give you a little bit of information also about me. Food relations. And that's when we're going to hopefully get some information from you. It's where we recognize our role, our role in our food choices. What are our memories? What are our habits? What brings us to the choices we make about food, okay? And finally, we'll talk about food choices in real time. And we'll talk about how do I, if I choose to, <laughs> alter the way I make food choices. But the first idea is to bring our consciousness to how we make those choices. Um, I will suspect that many or most of the members of the audience are highly aware people probably eat fairly well, if not really well already. And if you already know about your mechanism to make a choice, I offer you this as a, a refresher course, okay? If you're someone who says, yeah, about 50% of the time I'm aware, I have to be honest, bravo, chapeau, hats off. Um, that is really my goal, <laughs> is to be 50% of the time truly conscious and aware of how I make choices. And if you're someone who's saying, well, I'm aware of some choices and not others, then take in as much as you like. Um, in my idea of this seminar, it's an offer for you to take whatever you would like from it. And that's why I start with Food Speaks, which is what exactly does that mean? Yeah? And I want to tell you what it means to me. Uh, it started for me, I'm gonna stop sharing now so you don't have to be staring at that screen, okay? So it started for me, honestly, when I was a little girl. And I, my first memory is of being with my great grandfather and being in his kitchen. And he was a Spanish man. And he loved to cook. And I loved to be with him. And so I spent a lot of time with him in the kitchen cooking. And I didn't have the conscious awareness to know what that meant as a two and three and four year old. I just knew it made me feel good. And I really liked it. And I would imagine, I would ask you to imagine, your first memory of food, sort of get into the idea of 
what does food mean for you? And what is your first memory? Is it of eating food, preparing food, being served food, picking out the food inside of a, a market or a grocery? Um, and then I move on in my own household. My mother cooked everything from scratch, plus worked two jobs. She was one of those super women of the uh, late 20th century, late, <laughs> she'd love to hear that, um, of the 1970s and 80s, who really did everything. And she really spoke with food. And I tell you that one of the first moments when I understood that food really was a language was when my mother was in a, a, a serious depression, frankly. She was having a hard time and she didn't cook for two years. And oh. well, my parents were having some problems and that was her issue and her way of managing that was to go so deeply inside of herself that she stopped cooking. And it was like she needed to release everything about the way she had done those things and give herself some new space. Now, after about 19 or 20 months, I say two years, she started cooking again with new life and new gusto. And I was probably about 23. And I think that was really the first time I thought to myself, wow, like that's a powerful thing that this person who'd been preparing food and shopping for food and keeping food as a huge part of her life uh, just stopped. Yeah? She was young. She was in her 40s. So it wasn't as if it was some, uh, some might say midlife crisis. But I, I, I don't think that. I think someone said why. I, my parents were just having a very serious problem. And my mother used that time to do that. Um, and then not long after that, I dated someone who was a professional chef. And he had a very difficult time expressing himself verbally. And he would cook me the most spectacular meals and beautiful meals. If any of you have read the book, Like Water for Chocolate, the wafting, the scene of, of a meal as a, a representation, as a provocation, as a, as a love letter, uh, that really happened with this person. Um, we broke up and that's fine. <laughs> and, uh, it was again where I understood that food is a language and it's a language that in those moments I understood was being given to me. Uh, and today and now I want to turn into how we turn that language as an internal language. Uh, so I can talk, I'm sure all of you can talk and I'm, if anyone would like to share a story now of their first uh, experience or their first memory of food, would anyone like to do that? Anyone? I'm going to open the chat here. Okay. Anyone? No one is required. However, if you would like, anyone have a food memory they want to share? No. Okay. I'll keep going then. Okay. So the food memories, like I said, until that moment were very external. They were something that were given to me. And then I uh, moved to Vladivostok, Russia. And suddenly I found myself in a place where I didn't speak the language and I didn't really know how to enter into the place where I was. And by chance and very naturally, I found myself in the kitchen and I lived with a host family and that host family consisted of mom and two daughters. And we spent hours in the kitchen and we created a dialogue first with the food and then eventually I began to speak Russian. They didn't speak English and still don't, <laughs> even though we're still friends more than 20 years later. But we are truly bound. And part of that is because our experience of food really brought us, it weaved us together. And it was the first time I understood that I could speak with food. And I taught them to make spaghetti sauce and they taught me to make borscht and pelmeni and all the things that are part of their cuisine. And I got to share with them my cuisine. And it was a full on cultural exchange because it was the food, it was the language, and it was also very heart centered. So this brings me to the third aspect of food speak, which is the idea that we speak from our heart. I say third aspect. Really what I could say is that this brings me to the core aspect, doesn't it? Because I can talk about the external language, what I receive from others, what I give to others, but what makes the difference, what really makes me passionate about this is the idea that this is the, the core, the base of heart-based communication. So my medium is food, 
some people have a medium of writing, some people have a medium of painting, some people have a medium of poetry, some people have a medium of creating meetings, some people have a, a you know, we all have a medium. And I like to think of food as my medium for speaking. Um, anyone who's ever been to my house knows that you often leave with a doggy bag and it may not be even what we had for dinner. It may just be something you said you liked and then I offer it to you. Um, this is my way. Huh? Um, another time I was living in Turkey and a friend of mine, uh, <laughs> she found herself in a very odd position where she was about to divorce her husband and he became terminally ill. And she thought, what do I do? How do I manage? And I literally went to her house and spent two weeks there just feeding them, just giving them the space to figure out how to manage this thing. So it's also given me a way not just to speak my love and my appreciation, but I would dare say that what we contribute, what we leave behind in the world is something that at least once in our lifetime crosses our mind. And I don't know how many uh, tangible things I will leave behind. I hope so that I'll leave behind this idea of care and expression through food and that it moves forward. Now, Carolyn has shared a story with us, so I will share it with her. Thank you, Carolyn. She said in 1950s England, it was not a foodie's paradise. There were still rationing and continental vegetables were unknown. My mother didn't really know how to cook as she had been in boarding school until she went into the Wrens. And I can say that that's interesting, Carolyn's first experience with food, because I know her quite well, and she's a spectacular cook. So it also shows us that even if our first experiences with food were not necessarily the most enriching, if we choose to find our way with food, then we easily can. Okay, so I wrap up my story by saying that eventually I moved to Switzerland, which was a huge transition for me. Um, via Turkey and Italy. I moved to Switzerland and I found myself again um, looking for a way to communicate and to find my space and the result of that to be honest was actually literally <laughs> something called Food Speaks. So my blog uh, is called Food Mood and Food Speaks is a section of the blog where I share recipes and I share information about different experiences that we, meaning myself, my husband, my friends, have had with food. And even some people on the call have been guests on the blog. So I've been fortunate to have many people on this journey with me with food. Now, that's a little bit about me and about why I am uh, grateful uh, to be here and talk to you about this passion. The final piece I want to tell you is I'm so passionate about this that after 20 years of being a professional coach and a trainer, I decided to get a degree in nutritional therapy because I thought, okay, I love food. I want to find a way to bring food into my practice with my clients and with other people in a really tangible way. And so I spent four years studying the science um, of what that means. And so now I have the opportunity to have my heart-based ideas, which fully integrate with the idea of how do we nurture, nutri nutriate, I never can say that word. How do we find and give ourselves nutrition? Okay, so moving on to the next part of the topic, uh, which is food relations, okay? We wanna look at what do you relate food to, okay? So I want to start with something super easy. Does anyone have with them a beverage? If you do, just hold it up to your screen, if I'm seeing your screen. Or if you're not showing your screen, just hold your beverage for yourself, okay? Most of your screens are frozen for me, so it's very amusing to just be looking at a frozen screen. Hmm. So if you're holding a beverage, I would like you to consider what it is. Is it water? Is it coffee? Is it tea? Is it an herbal tea? Is it a green tea? Is it a black tea? And think for a second why you chose to have that by your side. It could be something as simple as, I have five seconds because I have three kids and I got myself a glass of water. It could be something as thought out as, I decided a half an hour before I was going to present this that coffee would be my best beverage, okay? So would anyone like to say what they are drinking? Anyone? You can write it like Carolyn did if you want, or you can. Sorry, technical. Go ahead, please. Okay. 
I'm drinking water with lime. Okay, and why did you choose it? I didn't get the time to get something else. <laughs> I had a yoga class. Nicole was part, part one of the participants. And I was still watching the video you sent me. And I just find myself in with a seminar. But I am kind of dreaming about having a cup of coffee. But I don't want to miss <laughs> the meeting. That's simple answer. No drama. No complications. Perfect. Well, conscious choice doesn't have to be dramatic or complicated. It's just a choice. You made a choice, right? You decided I'm going to choose to be at the seminar instead of making the coffee. So you made the choice to have the water. So thank you, Diana, for sharing. Would anyone else like to share? Anyone? No? Okay, I will. I will tell you that I chose coffee, not just because um, I love caffeine and I love coffee, but I chose coffee because for me, coffee represents being together in community. So when I have a cup of coffee, whether it be right now, I'm holding a Russian cup, um, inside of it is a cappuccino. Um, this for me represents the idea of being in community. And even though I'm giving a class online, I wanted to offer myself the feeling of being in a community physically in person. And so I made coffee. Uh, I would have made a Turkish coffee <laughs> if I was in community in person, because uh, it is my preference. Uh, because I like the process of making Turkish coffee. I like the idea of us making it uh, together. Yeah, um, but it's too short to have an hour and a half with. So Carolyn Buckley says she drank water. Also, um, Ilknur has water. And Pamela has water because I love it and it's healthy. Okay, it has been my favorite drink since childhood. Good for you. My father would have been really proud to hear that because he would never let me drink anything except water. Fortunately, I got over that <laughs> repression and drink water because I, I like it as well. Um, and then we have Gunanai says, I am not drinking anything. Sorry, I think I said your name wrong, Gunanai. I'm very sorry about that. Um, so this is just to get us started because I would like to solicit from you, not just about what you're drinking, but what is it that prompts you to make a choice about what you're going to eat? So for example, um, we, some of us have had a lot of time on our hands in these days. Other people have been super duper busy. If you're a medical professional, if you're homeschooling kids, you probably haven't had a lot of time to, to make a lot of um, elaborate meals and choices. However, um, when you do make a food choice, when you're there, excuse me, and you have to make food, what is the first thing you do to decide what you're going to make? Angela? Um, I think I'm, I'm, I decide what I fancy eating. <laughs> Um, it might be dictated by the fact that I bought two heads of broccoli and if I don't use them, they will go off quite quickly. But I very much, um, I have a need to eat spice or I have a need to eat vegetable or I have a need to eat something specific. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want, I, I want to make the choice. I'm one that's doing the cooking and I make the choice, which is very selfish. <laughs> Very rarely um, would Giorgio say, or he might say, can we have Saint so? And I think, oh, that's a good idea. We'll have it in two days time because I know this, this, and this needs to be eaten first. So I think I'm dictated a little bit by what's in the fridge, but then what's in the fridge has been my decision on what exactly. I actually want to eat. And I'm somebody who, I like a huge variety in my diet all sorts of different flavors. I don't want to eat repetitively. If I eat something one day, I probably don't want to eat it again for another two weeks or three weeks. I mean, there are standard things I can eat every day. I can eat a type of soup every day in the winter. I can eat mm -hmm. a salad every day, winter or summer. What goes okay. in it will vary. What goes with it by way of protein will vary. But but less, largely, I think I start with buying a lot of vegetables just because I like them. And then I work from there. Mm -hmm. And okay. I might buy a selection. Now I'm not shopping very much, which is a good, good training. I have to make a decision. So 
you know, I buy fish today, we eat it today, or we eat it latest tomorrow. So I'm dictated a little bit by that, but it hasn't changed things that much. And I think probably what it is with me is I just want the variety, whether it's that my body's got used to it or my body needs it, I've got no idea. But I do I would dare crave, say your body probably needs it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I crave a lot of variety in my diet of flavors, mm -hmm. of textures, of everything. Mm. I just like variety. So that's okay. that's me. Thank you, Angela. Could, would one or two other people like to tell us? And then I'll give some analysis of what we're saying. Anyone else? Someone else hi. has themselves unmuted for yeah, sure. Yeah, hi. Hi. Can you hi, I'm Chida. Yes, this is Chida. Nice yeah. to see you. <laughs> nice mm -hmm. to see you too. It's such a nice conversation. Thank you for Thank arranging you. that. Mm -hmm. uh, when I try to find something to eat, before I make it, make the uh, uh, plate, I think I kind of uh, think about the uh, feeling that I'm going to have when it's going to be done, you know. Mm -hmm. When I, 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 how can I, my sense of smell is uh, kind of good. So I try, I don't try actually, it comes to my mind that, so how will this taste like or how will I feel like when I will taste it? Mm -mm, uh, mm -mm. So sometimes I put some herbs um, depending on that feeling, you know? So mm -hmm. do I want to taste something sour? Do I want to taste something a, a little bit sweet in it? So mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it, if it is kind of, I don't know, awareness or something like that to be aware of what I would like to feel when I'll have the plate. I mean, and, and it's such fun, you know, it's, it's like a kind of journey. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Thank you Chidem. And I, I'm going to take a moment and make a couple of comments, both about Chidem and, and Angela, and then I'll ask other people, please, to continue forward. Um, uh, Chidem mentioned something really important. She said, I, I smell it, I can taste it. I want to know how I'm going to feel when I have that. And to be perfectly frank, on a scientific level, this is also really important because you activate digestion by thinking about food. So many people who have digestive problems, uh, on the basic level, we ask them, please, before you eat anything, stop for a second and begin to think about the food. Begin to think about how you're going to feel when you have the food. Is it going to make you feel like you're with a friend, a loved one, with someone who isn't with us anymore? Is it going to make you feel like you're on holiday? Is it going to make you feel like you're really giving yourself a big hug because it's cold outside and you want to have a nice hot soup? And that literally activates your taste buds, your, your glands. And the saliva starts to move, which goes down into your digestive system and begins to activate your digestive juices. So not only are you giving yourself a nice psychological benefit of, oh, I, I'm going to feel good when I have that food, you're actually activating inside of your body uh, how your body will digest the food. And then what this does is it increases the absorption of the food. And as many people may know, um, absorption is even more important on some levels than digestion because let's put them on the same plane huh? but you can eat all you want but if your body isn't absorbing it then you wind up being deficient and in fact with the covid one of the issues has been that people and mostly women have had digestive problems and have not been able to absorb and then they find themselves dehydrated and so this is a real spiral. So it's really wonderful. Thank you, Chidem, for bringing this to, to, to our attention. I appreciate it. And then it really is why I paused, because it brings right to what Angela was saying. She said, I'm not sure if it's habit or if it's really my body needs it or I want it. I would dare say, knowing, having the privilege of knowing Angela a bit, she grew up with someone who cooked well and cooked healthy and variety. And so in her mind, there's a connection between the variety and the creativity and the feeling the food gives her. Yeah? So, and, and this brings us to one of the most basic points we're going to talk about, which for me is at the core of the, the heart communication you have between yourself and your food, which is what have you bundled together your food with? Yeah? Um, I give an example. Um, I, uh, I love coffee, yeah? but I don't love coffee because I like the taste. I didn't drink coffee until I was 25. 
I was a tea drinker in America. But coffee for me, even though now I love the taste, it absolutely is coupled, as I mentioned before, with community and friendship. And if I'm feeling down, I know that a cup of coffee is a trigger to bring me up. Now, some could argue it's the caffeine, it's, and that is possible. However, I'm aware enough, conscious enough of my own triggers in my brain and my psyche to know that it's more than the physiological idea of what coffee does to me. It is the idea that I am hugely aware of the connection I feel through a cup of coffee. So I can be totally alone by myself, have a cup of coffee, and I'm visiting with all of you. Because in my mind, I go to that feeling. And as Chidem said, that feeling then feeds me as well. Yeah? Now, the, the, the power in this um, is because if I know that I'm using coffee as something, then I can find something to replace the coffee with. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying I have to replace the coffee, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself. I still want to get people to interact, but I want to show you the path we're taking. When I grow consciousness, um, hold on one second. Begum, Ezra is asking if she can please come in from the waiting room. <laughs> a little technical detail there, okay? So when, I, when I'm aware of these things, Chidem and Angela started off by giving us their ideas, as I bring those things to the front of my consciousness, to the front of my awareness, then I can make choices more clearly so that maybe when I want potato chips after I've had an argument with my husband, I can say, hmm, what do those potato chips give me? They give me that salty, gritty feeling like I've done something naughty and I'm great. And then I can say, what else can I do or eat that'll make me feel that same way? Nah. So this is the concept of bringing this idea of food speaking to us. It allows us to understand those connections so then I can much more uh, consciously, for lack of a better word, make those choices. So I'm going to come in here from the side. Um, Gluna, I'm sorry, I know I'm saying your name wrong. I decide according if it is seasonal, fresh vegetable, and easy cooked. Okay. So maybe for you, the ease connects you to something else too, yeah? And then you bring to seasonal. Seasonal is one of the most wonderful things because what happens? Food is also related to culture. I purposely fed my Spanish grandfather when I lived in Russia, when I lived in Turkey, because these things bring us to a moment not only in our life, but also inside of ourselves. Yeah? It becomes this connection, this dialogue we're having with ourselves. And as I mentioned, if you're already aware of it, fantastic, continue to grow it. If it's something you hadn't contemplated before, I really offer it to you because we're talking about it through the perspects of food. However, you can apply this to any decision you have to make in your life, as you're all well aware. This is the idea that if I understand what motivates, what is the intention under my choice, then I have a much broader variety of choices. Yeah? So would anyone else like to tell us about either what, why they choose what they choose, or maybe we can also start talking about what are some of your favorite things to eat? Let's see if anyone has the courage to tell us. <laughs> yeah, I would like to share something. Please. Please. Um, for me, uh, the taste of uh, what I'll eat is very important. It needs to be tasty, delicious. The, mm -hmm reason is i love to eat a lot uh, so for me like i'm always like trying to um, avoid myself from eating uh, excessive amount of food so when i eat something the taste should it's really important i don't want to put something in my system which i don't like to taste because i love to eat a lot i mean this is like <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think I'm with you, sister. <laughs> and in fact, you bring up something really important, Samela. You bring up the idea of discernment. Yeah? You've said to yourself, I know me. I love to eat. And I want to enjoy what I love to eat. I don't want it to just be there. I want it to be something I really savor. Which also brings to the idea of when I eat with pleasure, this changes as well. How many of you ever eaten after you've had an argument? Just put your hand up if you've ever, on the heels of an argument, eaten something. I can't possibly be the only person. Yeah. All right. So there's a few things that happen. First of all, I may not enjoy my food so much. 
Second of all, it may be that I don't have good digestion because then I'm in um, my um, parasympathetic uh, uh, nervous system and then I'm not properly eating because what I'm doing is I'm in fight or flight. All my digestive juices have gone out of my stomach into my limbs. And how often then do I get digestion, uh, pardon me, indigestion, or I wind up with heartburn, or I don't sleep well. All of those things have to do with what mood am I in when I eat the food. And this is something we really underestimate. Um, it's, as, as those of you who know myself and my husband, you know that it's a constant battle in our house to have the TV off during a meal. And for me, it really is about the idea that I don't want to take in the toxin of the news while I'm having my meal. However, one of the things I've realized over time is I give myself a worse stomach ache by fighting against the TV being on than just making peace and maybe eating separate in, on the balcony or putting in music on my earphones or making a compromise that we listen on the TV to something that is more to both of our tastes. Yeah. So it took years for me to figure out that I was doing myself more harm than good because the news was not giving me the toxicity. I was giving me the toxicity because of my own resistance and my state of mind while I was eating. So I share with you these examples to share with you, not to, to brag or, or um, to, to keep the center on myself, but to give you some uh, entrances into maybe some other habits that you find yourself having as well. So thank you, Pamela, for bringing us that as well very much. I have to say, I feel that way about wine. I'm not drinking any wine I don't like because I like wine way too much to waste a drop of drinking something I don't <laughs> Okay, would anyone else like to share with us one of their favorite foods or the reason that they choose to make a food? Both of those questions are open and will be useful to bring us into further discussion. Anyone? I would eat pasta every day, twice a day, but I don't because I know it's not good for me. <laughs> <laughs> now, Carolyn, what is it about pasta that makes you want to eat it so much? Um, Can you connect to that? Can you bring yourself to, under, to a space like that? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, on the one side, I really, the taste of it, the texture of it is, is very pleasurable, but it may also be connected with the fact that I discovered food when I came to Italy and it's very much associated with um, eating meals with people, having a good time. So I, I suspect that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. And the fact of the matter is, as you mentioned, thank you for letting me read out what you had there, you had grown up in a place where food was tasteless and, and a bit colorless. So then imagine you come to Italy in the 1960s, it's the Dolce Vita, the Bella Vita, and everything had color and it had texture and it had taste. And so if, if that does turn out to be part of the way that you um, experience that, that taste, then you could find other ways instead of eating pasta twice a day because you don't want to, not because... <laughs> well, I don't. I mean, that. I don't. I ration myself. But... Uh... <laughs> If I, if I didn't know it was bad for me, well, I, when I was young, I used to, because when I, when I was young, I could eat anything and digest anything, you know, in my well, 20s. Well, you're still young in my mind. But. <laughs> yeah, I am too, but my, my digestive system is not. So let's yeah. say up until my mid thirties, I had no problems. You know, I could literally eat and drink anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden, you know, your body changes and uh, your brain has to catch up with it. <laughs> Well, and also, Carolyn, you bring a really important point to the idea, which is sometimes the body changes and you said the brain doesn't catch up. Yeah. Part of that is how many of us ourselves or we know someone who wishes back to a time that is no more and that wishing back to a time that is no more in a way can make us a little bit frozen. Yeah. So what do I mean by that? So um, I use my husband as an example. He's in the other room. He wishes he were 25 because he lived in Los Angeles and he has a really sexy Italian accent. And you can imagine he had long hair. He was in Los Angeles. It was 25 years ago. It was great, right? So he wishes he were 25. And so he still holds on to some of those 25-year-old things. But now he's not 25 anymore and they don't necessarily serve him. 
Yeah. Um, but in his mind, they serve him. But as Carolyn was just saying, I'm trying to take the intention away from Carolyn so she doesn't feel singled out. So I, I use my own example. Um, in his mind, he's still there. But the body is not against us. The body is saying, you're not there anymore. Be happy where you are. Yeah? Find things to love about this age and this time and this place. And all of this, I think, is our body speaking to us and saying, wow, here you are, you wonderful person, you beautiful soul. You have so much more than you think. So go forward or be present to start. Yeah. Um, Carolyn says here, don't forget, I'm a Leo. <laughs> yes, indeed. We can talk about all those factors and why I took the example away from Carolyn, because my intention is in no way to, to judge zero, zero, zero. My intention is just to offer these ideas about how our relationship to food and our ideas, our convictions about ourselves shape the choices we make about food. And sometimes we're completely unaware. We don't have any idea that we even have that connection in our brain. I mean, maybe until Carol and I had this little two minute conversation, she hadn't really stopped to think, hmm, you know, what, what is it about that? and instead was thinking how I used to be able to do it. Yeah? So if I can understand that my body is giving me a message, that's another way that food is speaking to me. I give you another example for myself. White wine in the last six months, it's not doing me too good and we're coming into the white wine season, what shall I do? So I had to figure out and I, I can make myself a little, you know, white wine and water and then it seems to be okay. So it's, or I can just stop drinking white wine and find something else. What I want to say is if I continue to battle with my body to try to have the things the way I used to have them, I'm not listening to the food talking to me either. And then I give myself, as Carolyn mentioned, then there's a digestion problem, there's these other things. Part of it is physiological. I mean, having studied the science of it, I think everyone in the room is a woman, um, either going to, going through, or having gone through menopause, we know that our hormones shift, they change, it's physiological, it happens. The more peace we can make with that, the more we can actually maybe not have pasta twice a day, but maybe have it three times a week and I can still, you know, not gain weight or not have indigestion. Because it is shocking how little attention we give to our relationship to food. And by relationship, I mean all the things you've mentioned. I mean, what does the food do for me? What does it bring to me? How do I feel? What is the texture? What is the variety? All of these things make up our convictions about food and our choices about food within ourselves. There are some foods, for example, as an American for me, that I associate completely with white trash. And small cultural moment, white trash are basically lower economic based people with no education. It is a horribly racist thing to say. I'm aware of my, of my own delusion. And as a child, I grew up in circumstances that were just slightly above that. So when I see foods that are white trash, I immediately, it's a, I have this block that goes down because I have a cultural connection to they make me less of a person than I am. So what have I done? I've given I've given power to the food to define me as who I am. And recognizing that, I can disconnect that power. And I can do, it's just food, right? It's, 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 there's nothing about it, it's just a thing. It's, it's a glass of water, which for a long time I didn't like to drink water because I used to think, well, we're too poor when I was a kid, so all we had was water. So now I want, you know, and how many developing nations drink too much Coca-Cola for this very reason? because it makes them feel rich that they can have Coca-Cola. When in fact, um, I give you a, a, a true uh, fact, I was in, in the Himalaya last summer, not this summer, but before, and I met this group of dentists that come every year. They've been coming for 20 years to the same village and they come, and they said in the last five years in this village, they have seen a 100% increase in tooth decay among children. What is the reason? Coca-Cola. Because Coca-Cola came to the village, people said it made them feel rich because they could buy Coca-Cola, and now they give it to their children from age three in the bottle. Yeah, and we have all these connections, these ideas about what food means to us, and when we can recognize what, what they are, then we can disconnect them and make new connections. 
and those connections can carry us forward in a really healthy way. So if, if one more person wants to answer either what their favorite food is or what they make their food choices based on, then I'll move a little bit forward. Thank you so much for your input. It makes such a difference. Francesca, go ahead. Just unmute yourself first. <laughs> you have to okay. unmute yourself. There you go. Okay, I've done it. Now, I, I would say certainly recently, I've been much more interested in vegetables and how you cook them, how you make them interesting, and also eating a lot more raw food. Um, and that made me feel, makes me feel well and uh, gives me quite gives me a lot of energy. In fact, having had lots of water, I got my green smoothie, which I made yesterday, which I've really been enjoying. And and what made you make this change, Francesca? Uh, actually, it's uh, I needed to lose weight, so okay, okay, I did a, a detox at the beginning of the year, and it, that was all raw food, um, no meat, no no salt, no fish, no yogurt, no bread, no alcohol, obviously, um, and most of that, apart from the alcohol, I've kept going with actually, because it's made me and feel good. What is the um... How do I want to say this? So you started it out as something you did because you had a goal for your physical body. Yeah. What makes you continue? Because clearly your physical body isn't enough. No one stays on a diet ever. So something else happened that made you change or continue, let's say. I think well, it's a kind of, it's a kind of, it is a lifestyle change, actually. And, and I suppose I continue it because, because basically it makes me feel good, makes me feel well. And when I need something, I mean, occasionally I'll go into a shop and, and find I'm looking longingly at a piece of beef, which tells me I need to eat it. So exactly. I will exactly. buy. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. And recently I've been very keen on having curry. So not pasta, but curry. So I'm making loads of curries. I have no idea why, but at the moment, that's what I want. And it would be curious to know, is curry related to some family happiness? Is it related to your loving England? Is it related to something that gives you a feeling of comfort and joy? You don't have to tell us. It's just a curious yeah. question. Yeah. And I, you bring up something also, Francesca, that I'm super glad and I thank you for, which is the idea that if I force myself, for example, I was a vegetarian for 12 years. And when I went to Vladivostok, Russia in 1996, yes, 1996, there I was. I was in a far, far corner of the earth where meat and fish were the main food stuff. Like if you didn't eat meat and fish in that time in Vladivostok, you were pretty much going to starve. There, there was not the variety. Now if you go to Russia, you can find anything like anywhere. And I faced a dilemma. Not only did I face a dilemma because of what was available, but I faced a dilemma because I would go to someone's house or I was living with a host family. They would spend all their salary for the month to put this beautiful table together for me. And then I, arrogant American, would say, oh, I don't eat meat or fish. And they would at me like, you know, it, it was this whole cultural misunderstanding because I didn't mean to be arrogant. I didn't mean to be ungrateful. But the idea to them was, listen, this is what we have to eat. <laughs> we don't have the moment right now to have this luxury to eat these things. And so I introduced back into my diet meat and fish, basically as a, 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 a you know, a, a, a complete, say complete, is that right? Say complete for you French speakers. Um, and the idea was my body, for one year, I was ill. I had serious digestive problems for one year. You go 12 years without meat or fish, you start to eat meat or fish, your body does need to adjust. And now I'm in a place, many years later, <laughs> where Francesca has just said, if my body says to me, I think I need some beef, then I, I stop for a second, which is gonna lead us into the next part of what we're gonna talk about. I stop for a second, I say, okay, I need it. Is it that I need to feel some power or strength? Is it that I, my body is feeling, you know, I go into a, a questioning to myself. What does the word need mean? Because I think it would be fair to say that very often we use the word need when we need want. 
And if I want something, then it's much easier to dissect. But if I need something, then there's no need to really dissect. Because, for example, it may be that Francesca, her body's loving this, it's fantastic, and as she's not a full strict vegetarian, and she is not in this moment intending to be, her body says, right now I need that bit of iron. I need that because I don't have enough of that right now. She has her 100 grams of beef, and until six weeks later, she doesn't want it again. This is really, a, I think, a beautiful way to connect with what our body needs. Because the choice to be a vegan or a vegetarian, um, these are really choices. Yeah. Um, now, if one has an illness, this is something different, which we would have a whole different discussion about. Because if a person has an illness, this is really a very different issue. Because when you have an illness, you have to have a whole different inventory of what your body needs and why it needs it. And maybe you have to eat things you don't really want, but at that moment, it's what you need because of the medication you have to take. There's a whole other discussion. And I'm gonna put that on the side of the table because it's really not what I want to address here because it would be incomplete to make it just two minutes. Yeah? I want to say all things being equal, it's really important to recognize that I'm always in choice. Now I'm always in choice. I can say I'm a vegetarian and one day I wake up, I have a very dear friend here, a Swiss woman, She's been a vegetarian 20 years. And for Christmas, she makes chicken liver pate. It's what she loves. It makes her feel good. It reminds her of her childhood, being with her grandparents. And the rest of the year, she doesn't eat meat. Now, that's it. If she's in Parma, she does, not in Parma, in uh, San Daniele, she does eat a nice prosciutto. Because again, she, she doesn't limit herself to her conviction as a vegetarian. She limits herself to what is it in this moment I feel? Ah, I'm in this place where this thing is the thing to eat. I'm not gonna eat a plate this high. I'm gonna eat a little portion. I feel good about it. My body can still handle it. It's okay. Yeah? So there's a huge, um, how do I say, uh, trend right now to become a vegan among young people. And as a nutritional therapist, one of the things that my, a lot of my colleagues um, have encountered, especially in Ireland and England where I studied, are these, these people are completely malnourished because they become a vegan at age 18 or 19. And they think that means that they should just eat white bread and rice or, or pasta and you know, olive oil. And they don't have, um, maybe they grew up with parents like Carolyn um, who didn't really cook, so they don't have the cupboard like say um, Angela's mom was a, a covered kind of a cook so they don't have necessarily that input or they don't have the curiosity or they're at university and they don't have the time but they've made a political decision to have that lifestyle yeah? which is a totally different decision than someone even at 20 i'm not saying age is the point who says okay i want to eat like francesca said i feel great when i eat raw foods when i eat lots of vegetables i feel good so I'm going to search out ways to make sure that I know how to cook them, I know how to combine them, I make sure I get enough protein. An 18-year-old girl who stops eating protein, what's she going to wind up with? Guess what? Fertility issues. <laughs> because her hormones aren't going to properly um, be able to regulate themselves because she's not giving herself enough of the components that she needs for the hormones. To... So you see, all of these things are really related. So if I'm aware that I'm making a decision or a choice, then like Francesca said, I'm going to seek out ways to make vegetables take more, taste more interesting. I'm going to seek out different ways for them to be more colorful. Right now it's curry. Maybe in a month she'll be doing lots of Thai with coconut milk. We don't know, but she's consciously said, I feel good. I want to continue to feel good. So how can I find ways to make myself feel good? Now, going along that same tune, I, for me, raw food doesn't really work. If it's super hot outside, yes, I love raw food. But right now, my body doesn't like it. Some of us, some of you may have experienced this, when you're menstruating, totally different palate. If I eat raw food when I'm menstruating, I have severe cramps. So, you know, there's a way to manage also. I, I don't want to even pretend that there's one way for the rest of our lives. Because we go back to the conversation that Carolyn prompted us to. I'm here in this moment where I am. And to me, with that moment where I am and not wish I were somewhere else. Yeah? Now, food is the most tangible way to really experience that. Um, Begum and I have done quite a lot of traveling together. And one of the things Begum really instilled in me just by her being 
is eat what you can where you are. Because how many of us have gone on vacation and been like, Americans and Brits are particularly guilty of this, and Italians worst of all. Italians want their al dente pasta wherever they are in the world, and they're pissed off if the pasta's not right. Yeah. Brits, Turkey is filled with British, uh, let's say, uh, ghettos where you can get, you know, a proper English breakfast with the, the bacon and the eggs and the mushrooms and the ham. And Americans, they want everywhere ever. So, I mean, I'm making exaggerations. I'm making cultural, um, what shall I say, um, uh, unpleasantries, if you will. And I want to use those examples to say that that rigidity when I'm eating can really cause me more digestive problems and more issues with food than to have the capacity to connect with where am I now? Literally, physically, like am I in Spain or am I in New York City? And where am I now inside my body? Am I 25? Am I 35? Am I 55? Am I 75? Where am I? What can my body manage? I have a dear friend who's a Canadian woman, and she used to drink a glass of whiskey every night before bed. And she said, and then I turned 75. I couldn't do it anymore. I mourned, she told me. <laughs> she said, I mourned. I tried for another, say, six months. I would have less of a glass. I'd have just a sip. I couldn't sleep. And eventually she had to say, that time is over. Huh? And now she can have the occasional glass of whiskey, which she likes very much. But she also knows if I have a glass of whiskey, I can pretty much read all night because I won't be sleeping. Huh? So this brings me, I'm going to share my screen with you again. Okay. Thank you all for your input. I'm really grateful for them because they add a lot of texture. <laughs> okay, so we've done this. Can you see my screen, ladies? Just somebody do this if you can see my screen. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so this slide basically said your internal compass go with your gut. This is the whole discussion we've been having. Literally, in the vernacular, in our language, in all the languages, frankly, um, you can have some reference to people having a feeling in their gut. Like in, in Italian, we say, in la pancia, yeah, okay? So we have all these ideas and they really mean something because some of you may already know there's a book called the second brain and basically your gut gut being this area of your let me stand up and show you this is your gut right here okay this is your whole internal digestive system the um, large intestine the small intestine this area of your body holds 80 percent of your immunity and it literally can operate if your brain stops so your, your gut is a brain. It has a whole capacity to think. And the idea, we could get into a whole metaphysical discussion, which we won't, but the idea is that connection point, if any of you study any kind of Tai Chi or Qigong or even do yoga, you know that the, the key, the chi point, is basically between your pelvic bone and your belly button. And this point, this is where your prana is, where your breath is, your chi, your ki, your power, and shockingly, it's right in the middle of your gut, okay? So this is the point where you connect. And this is what I want to encourage you to use as a point where you connect with food. So food choices and everyday practice, okay? So all of you, I am positive in some way do this. Huh? What I want to do is just offer you the capacity to bring it to your conscious awareness. That's all. Because once I understand the mechanism, once I've defined the mechanism, mechanism, then I have access to that mechanism more easily and more automatically, okay? So Angela, for example, said that it's something that, oops, I took notes, hold on. Okay, so Angela said, I want variety, I like the texture. She then says the feeling that I have, that it activates me. Pamela said I needed to be tasty and delicious. Carolyn said, pasta makes me, brings me back to the vitality, the color, the change, the beauty of living my life in a different place. Yeah? So this idea is you want to bring your mechanism to the front of your brain. And how do we do that? The first thing we do is breathe, uh, literally breathe. Now, with my nutritional therapy student, students, clients, one of the things I really offer them, which is a tiny little change for some, really for some it's such a tiny change, makes a huge difference. Before you eat, take three deep breaths. 
it prepares your body for digestion. Now, those of you like Angela was saying, I'm the one who makes the food, so I make the decisions. She, I'm guessing, unconsciously, either closes her eyes and thinks what she has in the fridge or what she has in the cupboard or what she bought at the store. For me, this whole process that I sh I'm showing you on the screen, it starts when I'm thinking about going to the grocery store. Any of you who've been to the grocery store with me know that I love the grocery store. I love to go into the grocery store. And why is that? I'm already thinking what I'm going to put on the plate of my husband or my friends or me. And it gives me a real sense of purpose and a sense of community. Yeah? So whether your starting point is making your grocery list, entering the grocery store, entering the kitchen, turning on the stove, take a moment to take a breath. Pause. Huh. And ask, what does my body and soul need right now? Simple question. Now, you all received, I think, the sheet where I gave the, you know, the small description of the class. And I put there, let's see, I don't remember how many there were. I put one, two, three, six circles there. You see, I put these, you see my notes here. I put six circles. These are the questions we're going to ask ourselves during this course. We've already asked all of them in different ways. They're all the same question. They're all this question. What does my body and soul need right now? Not, what is my habit? Not, it's 12 o'clock, I have to have lunch even though I'm not hungry. Not, it's, I always have oatmeal every single day for breakfast and that's always what I'm ever going to have because that's what I always have and that's what I want. No? It's, what do I need right now? Now, if what I need right now, listen, the next one. I probably should have made those numbers, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll can send that out to you later. So, if I listen, what does my body say? If my body says, right now, what I need is a hot fudge sundae with banana split sprinkles. I personally am going to ask myself why, because I don't like bananas. <laughs> so maybe I need potassium. <laughs> um, and I'm also going to say, okay, now is that connection, is it here or is it here? Yeah. Why do I say that? Um, how many of you have decided what to eat based on what time it is. Yeah. Uh, it's morning, so I must have a morning food. Uh, it's evening, so I must have an evening food. Yeah. I lived for Russia in 10 years. I lived in Russia for 10 years. And I learned a very important lesson. Breakfast can be dinner. Dinner can be breakfast. Lunch can be midnight snack. Yeah. What I eat when I eat, these are not dictated by what time it is. They're dictated about what do I feel like eating right now? I mean, there's a joke in Italy that, you know, noon, every, all men pull up, put their feet under the table. Yeah, it's noon, it's 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, time to eat, it's 12 o'clock, yeah? I'm not hungry at 12 o'clock. If I'm hungry at 12 o'clock, I'll eat. Now, some of you have small children, some of you have work where you have a certain schedule. Okay, I, I absolutely get that. And then you work within those times and your body eventually becomes um, habituated to those times. I'm offering the idea that any time that you have to decide what you're going to eat, even if it's at a time, for example, maybe you're not hungry at 12, but you only have that one hour. That happened to me this morning. I wanted to attend Diana's class, and it was at 11.30. And 11.30 is about when I usually have breakfast these days. <laughs> so I decided that I would rearrange my schedule and have something much smaller to give me sustenance about two hours before because I wanted to take the class. Yeah. So I don't want to get into a discussion about people's limitations based on life requirements, because again, that's, that's a separate issue. I want to talk about in all things being equal, really ask yourself what you need right now. Some of you may be in a situation like me. My husband and I like very different things. I like lots of cumin and I like lots of anise and these kinds of um, Turkish Middle Eastern spices. And he doesn't. He likes oregano and basil and all the Italian spices. So sometimes I will make the one meal to ways because I don't want to give in to the way he wants it and I don't want him to have to give in the way I want it. So the most important thing is you ask yourself and all these examples I'm giving you are to give you the space to remember that there's a difference between what I need and what I want and there's a difference between what I think I'm supposed to do and what I actually need. Yeah. So often, I think we're dictated by what we think we're supposed to do, what I think I'm supposed to eat. It's one of the reasons I really wanted to open up what Francesca was saying, because she said something really important. She said, I started out by doing it because I wanted to lose weight. 
Then I discovered I felt great. This is a reason to continue. There are statistics globally that 90% of the people who go on diets wind up not only going off the diet, but gaining the weight back. Why is that? Because they felt coerced. They felt like, I just can't wait till the diet's over and I can do something different again. Yeah? When a person feels like Francesca did, then what do they do? They integrate it into their daily life. They, they recognize the connection between this choice about what I'm eating made me feel good. I want more of that. And like Francesca said, maybe sometimes she'll make a different choice because in that moment, she wants something different. Hallelujah. That is the whole anatomy of free choice, isn't it? It's not that I said I'm never going to eat beef again. No, you see, it's the capacity to, to slide between what your needs are in that moment. And let's be honest, I mean, there's this whole discussion about people having to, <laughs> Ezra sent something really funny about people having to go back in the office and, oh my God, what do you mean I can't use an elastic waistband? You know, this idea that lots of people have gained weight since they've been in, you know, housebound. The idea is that you don't have to never eat again things that are unhealthy. You just want to eat them because you've chosen to eat them, not because it's your habit or moreover, because it gives you a feeling you can't find anywhere else because then that also gets into another discussion. So then listen and then choose. Yeah. And then going back to how we started, how um, uh, Chidem said, be happy with your choice. Eat with gusto. When Pamela said, I need things to be tasty and delicious. Yeah. If I'm going to make a beautiful meal and then not enjoy it, it's almost criminal. First of all, because what a waste of time, what a waste of money. But second of all, what a waste of, of something beautiful and wonderful that I've made for myself. So really, these for me are fundamental. Now I'm going to stop sharing because I see that someone's made a comment and I couldn't see it. Okay. Yeah, this way we'll learn how to be present in the moment. Now this was Chi Den. Can you tell us what you mean by that Chi Den? Uh, what I meant was like it's kind of body awareness actually. I mean while you were telling us those things I felt it uh, actually it's the base of it. So uh, if we focus ourselves what we feel at that moment even though it's gonna be food wise it will teach us how to be in the present. It's a kind of Zen thing actually. Am I right? Yes, you are right. And in fact, I had a discussion with an Italian friend of mine yesterday, and she's really unhappy uh, living here. And she said, but I don't have a choice. And we talked about the whole idea of what choice means and so forth. And, and she said, but what you're saying is it's a state of mind, that my not liking my choice doesn't mean it's not a choice. Yeah, th that's exactly what it is. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting, you know, uh, every choice we make is going to give us immediate satisfaction. <laughs> what I'm suggesting is that there's an enormous power in knowing that I made a choice. And also there's a whole um, culture of victimhood around the idea that I didn't have a choice. Now, this is a whole nother um, <laughs> seminar, which I've actually suggested today, Gun, if we want to do to go forward, which is about the very concept of conscious choice and the fact that we always have a choice. I may not like my choices. I'm not going to pretend we always like our choices. However, if I can recognize that I've made the choice, even the one that is less uh, difficult or less difficult is not the right word, maybe I made the choice that was the hardest. There's power in knowing I made the choice, as you say to them, whether that be about food or anything else. So I use food because it's one of the mediums that I'm most passionate and comfortable with. Um, some other people use other things, but the idea is if it's like practicing anything, it's like building a muscle. If I build that muscle of recognizing that I'm in choice, then every time I have to make a choice again around the same thing, around different things, I can be stronger in making that choice. So what did Francesca do? She started out by making a choice. I don't feel healthy in my body. I want to lose weight. I'm extrapolating. <laughs> I want to lose some weight so I feel better. And then she made a choice. And in that choice, maybe she deprived herself of some things that she might have wanted to eat, but she was focused on the larger choice. She was focused on, I have a goal that I want to feel good about. And this is when people integrate 
lifestyle changes, which is exactly the word Francesca used. She said it really became a lifestyle change. And as long as that one works, it works. Maybe five years from now, we'll have a discussion with Francesca and she'll have taken a totally different lifestyle change and she will not be eating raw things. She'll only be eating, who knows, curry-based cumin. I, I, mean, I want to make up something really you know, absurd because the idea is don't get stuck that because I made that choice today, I have to make that choice for the rest of my life. Yeah? And as I mentioned with my Canadian friend with the whiskey, don't also get stuck in, oh, because now I, I've made the choice not to drink whiskey, I'm now old. Yeah? I mean, there's all this idea around choice. And food, frankly, is one of it, food and finances. These are the two things that make people most emotional, food and finances. Don't touch my food, don't touch my money. Yeah? It's really funny. You can talk about someone's parents, their spouse, their kids, it does not have the same effect as food and finances. And why is that? Because whether we're aware of it or not, these two things represent choice. Because if we start talking about finances, most of us have connected wealth with choice. When I'm rich, I'll have choices. It's not true. When I'm rich, I'll be free. Yeah? So we, we've created these connections, and these connections become our prisons. Because I forgot that I'm the one who made the connection in the first place. And I can choose to make a different connection. Yeah? Um, if we were to talk about addiction, yeah? and by addiction I could mean shopping, gambling, food, um, relationships, so many things. And what are addictions? Addictions started out as choices. Um, I was speaking, I was speaking, I can't remember who it was, about when they started to smoke and what um, prompted them to start smoking. And it was because they wanted to look cool in front of someone else. And then suddenly they found themselves smoking, you know, two packs of cigarettes a day. So, you know, now I give you another example because this is, I, I really like to provoke and offer you extreme. My father smoked two packs of cigarettes a day and drank a six pack of beer a day. And when he was 67 years old, the doctor said, Pete, if you keep doing that, you're going to die. My father said, I'm going to die anyway. And three years later, he was dead. Now, I'm not happy because my father decided to commit slow suicide, but I respect 100% that he decided that I would rather continue to do what I want to do in his way than give it up. He made a choice. He made a very, very conscious choice. He was not a dumb man. He knew that if he made the lifestyle changes the doctor was suggesting, things would have been different. And he didn't want it. He decided, I don't want to live longer. I want to live the way I want to live. I have another very dear friend. Her husband was a diabetic. And they, she's, she's in her 80s. And so they were in the 50s and 60s in America. They had, you know, liquid lunches. He was big in publishing. She was very big in hospital. She was the, one of the first female directors of a hospital. They had a high life. And they knew that with diabetes, he was not going to live as long as she. He said, you know what? We're going to make sure you have a nice nest egg, that you can live to be 100. You're going to live together as long as I can enjoy our life together. And in fact, he died when she's 83. He died about 20 years ago. And she went on to keep living and having a great life. Now, I am not suggesting that these extreme choices are necessarily what you're going to make. What I am saying is, Whatever you choose to eat, <laughs> whatever you choose to drink or smoke, be conscious of it. Now, that's all there is. That's it. It's just a matter of consciousness. And you said it so beautifully, Chidem, when you said um, it's just a matter of, you can call it Zen if you want. It's a matter of if I bring myself to the awareness of what I'm doing, then I know that I've made a choice. I would hate for someone to die from smoking and drinking and felt like they hadn't chose to do it. Really, I mean, I mean, the idea that, oh, it just happened. But, I mean, we make choices. And none of them are good or bad. Really, if you get to know me more from other seminars, you'll understand. I don't really believe in good and bad. I believe that each person has to do what's best for them. And that's why I wanted to offer this for you. Not to say, be a vegetarian, be a vegan, stop eating this, stop eating that, only eat this, only eat this kind of grain. No. I offer you, connect to your heart and decide what you want to eat. 
Angela loves variety. She gives herself variety. Francesca's love in curry and raw vegetables, go for it, you know? Um, she damn loves the feeling she has when she's eating, yeah? Continue with those things. They are what connect you to yourself. Don't allow yourself to become rigid that it always has to be the same way because you lose out when you do that, yeah? You don't have to eat and drink the same things for the rest of your life. Now, again, illness is a whole separate the category. I don't want to, 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 to um, in any way pretend that there are not limitations based on illness, but we're talking today about all things being equal, a person having the chance to make their choices, because we could talk about the choice of illness too, so there's a whole, a whole other discussion, okay? So before we wrap up, does anyone want to ask any questions? Anyone? I'm still drinking my coffee. <laughs> yes, Angela, please, please, please. Well, I'm, I'm just interested, you know, I accept all this, listen to your body. But how does one actually differentiate what is, is a craving for all those reasons that we speak about? Because we may be angry, we're premenstrual, we're, um, <laughs> you know, th there's loads and loads of reasons. I mean, there are people who will survive on what they think is listening to their body, which is basically craving constantly the fat, salt, sugar cycle. So, I mean, I'm lucky I don't, don't have that addiction, but you know, how does one help people like that? Because it's very easy if you don't have that to, okay, have a day where sometimes you do crave something. And whilst you can say, I need it, I needed four squares of chocolate or I needed something, you know, six glasses of wine or whatever, you can justify it. But, you know, the next day you're not going to feel the same way and you're probably going to feel a bit rubbish afterwards because you're not used to giving into that. But how come there are people who are on that cycle? Why, why can't, I, I can't understand that they can't feel terrible. If I don't eat the way I enjoy eating and I eat excessively of something because maybe there isn't a choice that day and the excessive would be a lot of carb, which is probably a lot of salt and also a lot of sugar and fat, I would just feel wretched. Now, how can these people override what is... Mm -hmm completely override what their body's saying and talk themselves into thinking that's what they need like like you know kids coming out of school need a chocolate bar or need a, a mcdonald's on the way home i mean you know when i grew up one you wouldn't have had the money in your pocket and two those things weren't available so the need is surely being created by the food industry and some, some people ways, are yeah. more susceptible to that than others and then that's a whole psychological issue which i know you can't go into now but i just find that what makes one person instinctively have basically very healthy good food choices and what what uh, what creates someone who has absolutely nothing on that on that sphere and and i just find that fascinating and maybe through your study you might have an idea yeah in fact before i do have two or three comments to make and before I do that, I would really be happy to hear if anyone else would like to address what Angela is saying, because I, I believe that there's at least one or two people, if not all of you, who have some opinion about it. And I'd be very curious to hear your thoughts. Although you are not required, obviously, but if anyone would like to share their thoughts, anyone? Go ahead, Ezra, please. She's absolutely right about this sugar craving. And not only children. I mean, I always have sugar cravings and I know it's not good for me. So it's a very fair question. How do you differentiate what your body tells you you need and then what you actually feel like I have to eat this? What's the, uh, how do you differentiate between them really? <laughs> Anyone else want to make a comment? Anyone? You're all welcome. This is the discussion, I hope. <laughs> There's no right or wrong answer, by the way, just to let you know. Hi. Again? Hi. 
<laughs> uh, once I read that uh, food cravings uh, gives the signs of uh, some minerals that that are lack of in the body. So mm -hmm. I think chocolate is uh, how can I say? Is it with chrome? Chrome or is it? It's linked with magnesium. Chrome, magnesium. So uh, I'm wondering if. Um, if we hear that, uh, if we see that sign as a lack of minerals, uh, will it be possible to uh, replace it with the healthy one? Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm noting down here, so I will address all of these things, yeah. But I still want to make sure, is there anyone, thank you, Jidan. Is there anyone else who'd like to give a, 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 a stab or an idea? Pamela, do I see you reaching for the mute button? No. Okay. Francesca? Um, I, I would actually like to ask a sort of complimentary point to that. Um, I have a goddaughter who is um, very severely anorexic. And I would like to ask what happens when you have a situation like that where somehow you're, you're in, at, at such a stage of battling with your body that you're unable to see what your food choices are doing? Well, it's not about food at that point, to be perfectly frank, Francesca. Unfortunately, anorexia has very little to do with food. Okay. I mean, I can answer that much more thoroughly, and that is the short answer of that question. Okay. At that point, food is really at the bottom of the list of the discussion. So, thank okay. you for asking. Thank you for asking. Anyone else want to add anything before I give my <laughs> monologue here? Okay, so I'll start with Francesca's because this is the, the bottom of what we're talking about. And I'm going to, uh, let's, I think I can give a composite answer to all the different components of what you're talking about. And why I start with Francesca is because we don't necessarily recognize that food is a language. <laughs> And an anorexic person is using food to control. And they feel that they have no control and they want to control something. And so they use food as that control. And then they lose complete perspective about what their body actually looks like. They don't even see their body anymore. Um, and unfortunately, severe anorexia basically leads to complete malabsorption. And then if it's a young person and they recover, usually they wind up being infertile they wind up with osteoporosis, they wind up with all these sort of long-term issues because as a young, especially woman, because it's, it's about 85% women, um, they are at the very crucial moment. We don't realize between 18 and 30 is a hugely crucial moment for the building blocks of our body. Till age seven is another discussion altogether, but as women for our fertility and so forth, this is a really important moment. Really, a, from the time you get period, which I, I shouldn't say 18, I should say from the time you begin your period. Um, and so if you starve your body during that time, you really will wind up um, with a lot of long-term issues. Now, to address anorexia, really, psychology is the only way to do that. Um, most studies show that anorexia has to do with uh, a conflict with the mother. Um, and the only, the only times I have ever seen anorexia, and I, I can't say I have billions of, of examples, I have about a dozen, um, it was only when the mother and the daughter wound up in some sort of therapy and then things were able to improve. Now, I am not an expert on that. I'm giving just my opinion on the very small amount of, um, of uh, medical knowledge I have from my study. But what that brings me to is the question about cravings. And she then mentioned about chocolate. Yeah. So especially the period is the best time to talk about this because most PMS, most, literally most PMS women up to something like 97% crave chocolate. And there are several reasons for that. Part of it is magnesium because our bodies need it. And it also, it's escaped me the name, but it does something also serotonin. It, it increases our serotonin, I want to say, increases our dopamine. So it gives us that feel good, just like caffeine does. Yeah. And we want that because when you're having PMS, it means your hormone levels are down, you're feeling down, you're feeling melancholy. And the chocolate, dark chocolate, by the way, because milk chocolate is just going to make you feel sick. Um, dark chocolate gives you that extra kick that you want. Now, those moments have the square of dark chocolate. Yeah, I mean, denying yourself a small square of dark chocolate is almost a torture unless you're allergic or something like that. But what you bring up, Chidan, is the idea that 
Andrew, we're going to get to your question and Ezra's uh, follow-up, which is about when we're not even aware, okay? But while we're still talking about we start with anorexia, that's a gross awareness because you can physically see it. She dems was a craving, which is a physical awareness. Um, you can go to your doctor and have a test. I mean, am I low in iron? Am, am I low in, you know, am I having, mag you know, you can find these things out because many nutritionists, We'll give people who have diabetes or people who want to lose weight certain combinations of food that reduce craving. So there's a woman in my, our book club, and she wanted to lose. She was, this woman's amazing. At 75, she decided that she needed to get rid of her hips because they were too big. And so she wanted to lose something like 12 kilo. Fortunately, she's also a very smart woman. And so she went to a nutritionist. She didn't try to starve herself and so forth. Because at 75, you try to lose that much weight. I think you could wind up with some broken bones and so forth. So in any case, the nutritionist managed to give her different combinations of food that she never craved another thing again. So for example, if you find yourself craving lots of sugar, it doesn't mean you should stop eating sugar cold turkey. That's like an alcoholic saying I'm never going to drink again and then keeping the bottle there in front of them. I mean, it, it doesn't work. What you do is you couple your sugar with a protein. So for example, that piece of chocolate, you have three almonds with a piece of chocolate because what does protein do? Protein actually fills us up and it gives us a feeling of being full and it makes us reduce the craving. So um, for example, in Turkey, one of my favorite things, beautiful dried fruits, stuffed with nuts. This is such a wise uh, snack. It's a complete meal. So as a nutritional therapist, I tell people, you have a, a, a power plate or you have a balanced plate. And what does that plate look like? Um, I draw it. I'm going to draw it for you. Okay. Uh, shoop. Okay. So the plate looks like this. Can you all see that? So basically you have a whole plate. Half of the plate is one thing. And then you have the two quarter pieces, okay? This quarter piece here, I'm doing this on the fly, so excuse me. So you have protein, complex carbohydrates, and veg fruit, okay? So what is a date stuffed with a walnut? It's exactly that plate in your hand because you have your fruit, the date is a complex carbohydrate, and the walnut is a protein. So some people get really confused and they think they have to have a whole plate of dates stuffed with walnut. <laughs> and I say, no, you just need to have in your hand, just, just there in your hand, yeah? You, you, you have your, your, your dried fruit and you stuff it with a nut. Because what is it? The dried fruit is high in, in sugar, in, in glucose. Um, but you don't need to not eat sugar. That's insane. Your body needs sugar. I was listening. I, I listened to all these things so that when I speak, I can make sure that I have like global information. And this disgusting woman, <laughs> I'm being silly. I'm being silly. I've been on with you an hour now, so I allow myself to be a bit silly. Um, she was this, like this, perfect, flat stomach, 55, blonde, perfect, telling us to never eat sugar again. And don't eat fat, she said. What do you mean don't eat fat? If you stop eating fat after age 50, you're going to really damage yourself. You need to eat fat. Do you need to eat a spoon lard into your mouth? No. Olive oil, avocados, dried fruits, you know, good healthy cheeses, goat cheeses. You need to eat healthy fat. But you can't stop eating fat. And you can't stop eating sugar. You just have to decide what kind of sugar am I going to eat? What am I going to put my sugar together with? So for example, this cup of coffee together with a piece of chocolate is really going to go right to my head and I'm going to wind up feeling a bit uh, jittery. Yeah. If I have this cup of coffee with my magic coconut cookie, which is made with egg whites and coconut, which is pure protein, and then a little bit of chocolate, and I have one. That's a totally different story. Yeah? So don't think that we have to cut all these things out. It goes back to what Francesca said, what Carolyn said. It's a matter of deciding when, what, not never again and having a rigid idea. Yeah? Now, to get to what Angela originally said and to what Ezra said about the idea of what do I do 
how do people not feel things? I, I think I would dare to say that I'm in the company of educated people. And by educated, I don't mean you all have PhDs. I mean that you are people who have taken the time, it's why you're here in this seminar. You've taken the time to learn things. You've taken the time to know your own body. You've taken the time to know your environment. And by environment, I don't just mean global warming. I mean your immediate internal and external environment. So you're already <laughs> like 10 steps higher than the average person. And that is not a judgment. It just means you're seeking people. And as seeking people, it would of course seem strange to you. How can a person not notice they feel bad? I am very sorry to say that most people are used to feeling bad and they don't notice that they feel bad. Yeah. How many of you have had or have currently in your life someone who is addicted to anything? Sugar, caffeine, alcohol, drugs, shopping, coffee, anything. Anyone? Me for sure. Yeah. Does that person know? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. I, um, I grew up as, I'm, I'm the daughter of an alcoholic. That's a label on my forehead, yeah? Um, I don't live that label because I'm much more than that, and that is a piece of who I am. Why am I telling you that? Because based on that, I spent time going to Alcoholics Anonymous, going to Al-Anon, because I wanted to understand what, what is this, this thing that I'm living with? And I don't mean thing the person, I mean the, the, the behavior. Yeah? And what is one of the things I, I learned, but I didn't really understand until much later in my life, the recognition that there is a problem is the single most important way to heal the problem. It's, you're already at 70% healing if you say, I have this addiction. And it seems ridiculous. Why would that matter? For the very reason that Angela asked her question. Because if I don't lift the veil from my eyes and notice that there's a problem, I can never do anything about it. So if I continue to think feeling bad is normal, then why would I make a change? Why would I change anything if feeling bad is just what I always know? If I wake up every day with a headache, how will I know the difference between not waking up with every day with a headache? Now, I'm using extreme examples on purpose. Yeah, this is obviously. Um, we can say things that are much more um, mundane. You know, how does a person not notice they're overweight? How does a person not notice they have bad breath? You know, because bad breath, teeth issues, digestive problems. How many of you know someone with bad breath? Either they have a problem with their teeth or they have a digestive problem. I have a very dear friend who had stomach cancer. The entire time that they were having treatment, if you stood within, forget two meters. I mean, <laughs> you, it just came out of their mouth. Yeah, they, they were rotting inside. I'm very glad to say that they are healthy and healed now. Um, and it's all a matter of what's happening inside. And if I don't notice myself and I keep the blinders on, why do they keep blinders on horses? Because then you can keep them doing what you want for as long as they can. And really, Angela, Ezra, we could get into a whole other discussion, which really could be a whole other discussion about, um, am I a victim of the food industry? Or am I a victim of my own unwillingness to take responsibility for myself, my body, my health? I'm not going to pretend that the food industry is not strong. I'm not going to pretend that there's lots, there are huge external factors happening. But all of you took the time to be here for an hour and a half today. I mean, we can take the time. I, I, um, I'm skating on a really thin line here because I don't have a judgment about the people who choose not to. And I believe it is a choice, even if it's a choice made unconsciously. Um, what I think is really important is that if I see someone I love who has those blinders on about something that maybe I can offer something about, I find a delicate way to offer it and then I leave it on the table and I go away. Yeah. Um, because it's not my place to, to tell them or to judge for them. Now here you came to this. I had something to offer you. You allowed me to offer it to you. You offered something to all of us. So then we got bigger and bigger and we've hopefully um, expanded out what I prepared to include what you've offered each other. And my hope for you, um, we're going to end probably about 20 minutes early, is um, don't rush off and do something else. Just sit for a minute. <laughs> sip water or take a deep breath and give yourself a chance to digest this because that's my other tip for you um, physiologically. Deep breath before you eat and when you're done eating, 
stay seated for five minutes. Just stay seated five minutes. If you can, ten or five. People used to sit after a meal and talk for an hour. There's something really beautiful about that and something really healthy about that. Because We've lost you, Nicole. You've frozen. Can anybody hear anything? No, frozen. No. Ah, I can hear other people, but not you, Nicole. You've frozen. I think it's this me. is a this is a message. It's Ava. <laughs> <laughs> no, she'll be back. A kiss to greet, I believe, but. Yeah, but she's completely frozen. She's not hearing our conversation. I actually lost her video as well, so it means maybe she uh, has some connection issue. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I can see her picture, but frozen, so I think she's mm -hmm. lost. Zoom has probably said, that's your lot. Well, mm -hmm. I will bid everybody farewell. And bon appetito for, for later. Yes, thank you. Same thank to you. you. In fact, this has made me hungry now. I want to go. In listen. fact, <laughs> I, yes, I, I will make. I'll make read a and listen story. what we need to eat. <laughs> I, I'm going to have three three nuts and half an apple. Yes, I'm going to have three nuts and a date. <laughs> there we are. I wish you all the health. Yes. Enjoy Everybody, your stay well, stay healthy. Yeah. And yes. Thank you, you very you. much. Thank. Thank you very much for joining. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. bye Nicole. Bye. Bye. Thank bye, you. Bye Nicole. I hope she's hearing us. Yeah. yeah well, if not, she can go pick it up on the tape. Maybe. I don't know. She's still frozen. She's out. She's completely out. Yeah. Well, she I'll says it kicked me off, and I cannot. Uh, it won't let me get back on for some reason. Okay. No. Well, I think Zoom has. I think Zoom has a time limit, doesn't it? And we've well exceeded no, it. No, uh, it's, it was forty minutes, and we. I think she's already downloaded or something. It should have been longer than that. We should have. No, no. We we have an account that has huh? no time limit. Actually. All oh, right. Hmm. Oh, okay. Well, thank you very much. It was interesting, and thank you, and good to see everybody, and everybody keep well and keep eating, because there's <laughs> nothing better than good food. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you. Ciao, Angela. Bye. This says, make my farewells and offer them my contact info. So I will do that to whoever is uh, wishing. I guess most of you are her friends, and People who know me, I can give them um, always Nicole's contact info. Yes, please. That would be cool. Thank you. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Maybe okay. Most of us. Thank you for organizing. I'm, I'm writing it down. And also, uh -huh. you're very welcome. Begum, is that you? Yes, it's me. <laughs> okay. okay. Just making sure it's you because I wasn't sure. I just see your uh, symbol. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Bye, Kush. Yeah, thank you for joining us. So her blog is Food Mood. It's called Food Mood. I've mm -hmm. written it down. Yes. And her Instagram and her... Uh... Okay. So you can follow her by. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.